Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Michael Downey and in this session we take a look at aerating ferments. Discover new insights into how and when to consider introducing air into a ferment and associated impacts from an analytical and sensory perspective. Now this webinar is the first of several planned activities that will provide Australian winemakers a suite of package tools to make better decisions around how and when to introduce oxygen into an active ferment. Following this session, the AWRI will be distributing a survey aimed at gauging your interest in being involved in trials of using oxygen during fermentation in vintage 2021. So if you're interested in getting involved, then I strongly encourage you to look out for and complete this survey. Now, before we make a start, a couple of very quick reminders for anyone that's new to AWRI webinars. To provide a comment, ask a question, um, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send it through. And also a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view uh, later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. For those of you that have just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is aerating ferments, why aeration is useful and how you can do it. And joining us to discuss this practice, we have Dr. Simon Schmidt. Simon is a research manager and since arriving at the AWRI in 2005, his interests have focused on the relationship between nutrient availability and yeast fermentation performance. Yeast, yeast stress tolerance and the role of oxygen in shaping fermentation outcomes. So Simon, it's great to have you on board to guide us through the science underpinning this practice and reflect on some of the practical outcomes. So if you're ready to make a start, I'll pass it over to you to get us underway. Thanks, Michael. And um, let's see, let's get this going. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we've been experimenting with aeration during fermentation uh, for a few years now. And yeah, as Michael said, I wanna today discuss about some of the key impacts aeration has on wine composition. So um, what you can see over here in the picture on the right here is when uh, that gets that process gets a bit too excitable. Uh, so yeah, we're making mistakes so that hopefully you guys don't have to and predominantly what I'm talking about today is aeration, yeah, as I said, during fermentation. So what's uh, going to be the contents of this talk? Primarily, I want to begin with um, discussing what dissolved oxygen is, what I mean by that, how do we measure it, and some options for folks who are out there interested in doing that to measure it. I want to give some pilot scale examples of aeration in red and white ferments and discuss the key impacts that that aeration will have. And finally, I want to round out the talk with some methods for implementation that you can use in the winery. So dissolved oxygen, what is it? As the name suggests, it's the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in a liquid. But in the examples I'll be talking about today, um, they're all about adding air rather than oxygen. And although you can use oxygen, it's probably not um, really advisable to do that in the winery due to um, potential explosive issues. Um, so yeah, all the, all the experiments and different details we're talking about today is about pumping air through a ferment. Now, as oxygen makes up about 20% of air, it has to partition from that gas into the liquid. And in the approaches I'm, we're uh, using to aerate ferments or you, you can use to aerate ferments, really what you're trying to do is trying to find ways to make this partitioning more efficient. When we're talking about the amount of dissolved oxygen in a liquid, there's three way, really ways of talking about that. Um, and you might hear myself or others uh, refer to different types of those measurements. The first is percent air saturation. So this is the relative value that, um, it's a relative value and it's the percent of the respective saturation values. So when you're trying to pump air into a liquid, the maximum amount of air that, or maximum amount of oxygen that can be dissolved in that liquid is called the um, air saturation limit. It's a sort of a, it's, it's not a constant and it's dependent on a range of different factors that I'll talk about in a minute, but primarily those factors are temperature, atmospheric pressure, 
and the composition of the liquid. Um, the other uh, metric, I guess, is just the straight concentration. So the mix per liter or PPM of oxygen in that liquid. And finally, it's the um, partial pressure of that oxygen. So uh, millimeters of mercury. And for reasons, uh, probably because of how difficult it is to pronounce, probably most of us don't talk about millimeters of mercury. So predominantly you'll be hearing about percent air saturation and uh, the concentration. So when we talk about percent air saturation, as I said, it's a relative measure and it's dependent primarily on the temperature. So on the graph here on the right, what you can see is the maximum concentration of oxygen you can get into a liquid at its saturation limit over uh, different temperatures. So for example, at, at um, 10 degrees or 15 degrees, the maximum concentration of oxygen in that liquid is around 10 mg per litre. But at 30 degrees, the maximum concentration of oxygen in that liquid is around seven and a half um, mg per litre. So there's you know, roughly a 30% or 25% decrease in the concentration of oxygen, just dependent on the temperature across a range that we would commonly use in fermentation, 15 to 30 degrees. Atmospheric pressure has a otherwise relatively small impact. Uh, and you can see that by in the blue line here, um, the concentration of oxygen at sea level for a particular temperature and at 500 meters for a particular temperature. So primarily, I guess we're concerned with temperature as being the main impact on the concentration of oxygen that you can get into your ferment. Um, and it's, it's because of these differences um, that, that pumping large volumes of air with a spear versus using sinters uh, presents quite um, a lot of differences in the amount of oxygen you can end up with. We're trying to provide the most efficient ways of getting that air in. Measure, there's different measurement options uh, now that you can use for measuring oxygen in your ferments. Um, the first, uh, most traditional, I guess, is electrochemical probes. They've gone out of fashion generally nowadays because they're slower and they require a lot of regular maintenance. More often than not now, we're moving to probes that require, that are based on an optical type system. And there's a picture on the right here um, from, uh, of sort of NAB from Pyroscience that explains how that kind of works. But basically, um, they come in a variety of formats. Um, they're quite robust, they're fast, and they have variable sensitivity. And they basically operate based on a dye that's attached to the end of the probe. Um, light is shot down the probe and interacts with that dye in different ways um, and depending on the probe manufacturer and returns a different signal back to the, um, the sensor module. And so using these systems, we can determine the dissolved oxygen concentration directly in the liquid. The third way that people are using are using redox probes. Um, these are quite different in operation. They're more similar. You're not measuring oxygen directly. They're more similar to a pH probe. And really these are measuring the ease with which a molecule will accept electrons. And I guess I can think about it as an indirect measure of oxygen. And really for process control, this may provide a more stable signal. The dissolved oxygen probes in fermentation vessels sometimes can be quite noisy. But from my perspective, I guess redox probes are a little bit difficult to understand what they're actually measuring. Uh, they're not so intuitive simply because it's an indirect measure of, of the, the whole system's response to oxygen or oxidation. So questions related to um, grape fermentation in general that I'll be covering today is what are we really aiming to achieve with wine aeration? And I wanna talk specifically about aeration timing, duration and intensity, and whether there's room for operational flexibility in the implementation of different types of aeration programs that you might think about. And in general, from our research perspective, we're moving a lot from the why, why you'd want to do aeration to the how. So how best can you implement uh, aeration in the winery? In the start of all of this, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that the biochemical process of oxidation or interaction of air with the system begins um, with the great breaking of the great berries berries, so at, at harvest effectively and crushing of the grapes. And during that process, uh, that material can take up reasonable amounts of oxygen, uh, some numbers um, bandied around down the bottom of the screen here through crushing and pressing. Uh, 
but it's that it's at that point that the whole process of uh, the, the system taking up oxygen begins. But then it's about um, how much oxygen you actually deliberately want after that process, which is a bit difficult to control. Then it's to the point where you can control how much air is coming into your system. And I'm going to begin um, talking about this in the context of red wine. And I'm going to be talking about red, both red and white wine today, but because they're really distinct in their response, they're as distinct in their responses to aeration as they are in the actual process of making them. So yeah, I want to talk about them separately um, and talking about red wine first. So over many vintages, we've been investigating the effects of adding air during fermentation. And in particular, we've been primarily working at what we call pilot scale around 450 kilos. And in all the Shiraz ferment, all the ferments I'll be talking about uh, in the red wine section are all Shiraz. We're implementing aeration in these ferments by, via sparges that are installed in the bottom of the tanks. And I'll talk a bit later about different ways you can do this, but for us, that was the uh, most effective way of doing it. In this particular experiment, what we were looking at was the effect of different modes of adding aeration. So our aim with this was to determine whether aeration regimes, different aeration regimes, when the total amount of um, oxygen or air added is similar, can change the way the ferment responds. Um, and so in this case, we're looking at um, ferments that have been repeatedly aerated. So in this case, uh, once a day, for an hour a day for four days, or a short single aeration, so uh, four hours at a high aeration intensity, trying to mimic the total amount of air that's introduced through that repeated aeration, or a single long duration aeration. In this case, it was 48 hours, but a very low um, flow rate of air going in, so low intensity. And so what we can see by um, a look at the fermentation kinetics in particular right off the bat is that throughout these different aeration regimes compared to the control which is shown in blue or sorry in purple in the back there is that there was no effect on fermentation kinetics in red wine through the use of aeration and that was consistent across uh, many vintages of us looking at aeration in red uh, red ferments and so that's quite distinct from whites as you'll see later on and um, in the literature uh, aerations used um, for stimulating fermentation kinetics, specifically in whites. But in reds, we really don't see that impact on fermentation kinetics. What we do see is uh, quite a large impact on um, uh, compositional factors related to uh, tannin structure and different fermentation products, which I'll talk about in a moment. But before I get there, I just want to show um, how the total amount of oxygen in these treatments uh, mapped across the different types of treatments. So on the left here, what we're showing is um, re recordings from the probes installed into the tanks. And in blue there, you can see these different repeated treatments. Um, over time, the singular short duration treatment for four hours and both of those treatments, we reached about 80% uh, air saturation. So that's equate, equates to around six mg per litre um, of oxygen concentration in those ferments. And the, lo the long duration, low intensity ferments um, reached about 12% air saturation and that's uh, substantially lower, closer to around one mg per litre dissolved oxygen concentration. Now we can, we can get a feel for the cumulative oxygen exposure over that period of time through integrating the area under the curve um, in these measurements. And we can see here that the repeated, the cumulative oxygen, oxygen exposure during the different aeration regimes is roughly similar. There's around between two and three air saturations received by each of these ferments over the lifetime of that ferment compared to the control, uh, which received relatively small amounts of air, cumulative oxygen exposure, I should say. And that really just reflects the um, amount of air that you would get in during normal uh, cap management pumping operations. So on to the impact of aeration on composition. I'm only going to really talk about uh, three uh, compositional factors here. Um, the first being total uh, phenolics. And as you can see here, 
with increasing aeration treatment, we reduce the amount of totophenolic material recovered from those wines. Primarily the highest seen in the no treated, untreated or non-aerated samples with the short high intensity um, aerations being next and then reducing again to repeated and the long low intensity aerations. So if you cast your mind back to that previous slide, the highest oxygen exposure was in the short high intensity treatments, but the highest effect on phenolic material was the long low intensity treatment. So we already can see that it's not just about how much air a ferment receives, but um, the way in which that air is put into the system. A similar sort of impact is seen on wine color density or color intensity. Again, uh, the non-aerated ferments were the um, most, the wines with the highest color density. And again, repeating, uh, reducing in line from um, short duration repeated treatments to long, low intensity treatments. And finally, um, just an example of a yeast derived aroma compound, predominantly what we see during these aeration treatments in reds is an increase uh, in the amount of low molecular weight or small branch chain aroma compounds uh, derived from amino acid metabolism. And in this case here, I've given an example of ethyl 2 methyl butanoate that increases uh, substantially from no treated to repeated short and long, low intensity ferments having the highest concentration of this compound. These are all analytical measures and some of the differences look quite small. So what's the impact, if any, on perceived characteristics in the wines? So obviously we undertook sensory descriptive analysis of these wines uh, to look at just that question. And that's what I'll be talking about next. So to explore the relationship between various compositional parameters and the sensory data, uh, we used partial least squares regression. And this is quite a busy slide. I just want to talk about one or two aspects of it. And hopefully I can walk it through without getting stuck too much in the details. But basically uh, this partial least squares regression analysis tries to maximize the covariance between analytical parameters, which are on the right here in these little blue dots. So these are all the things we measured. And a second data set, the sensory parameters, which are in red on this slide. So this is sort of what we call the correlations loadings plot. All of these things are, um, are added up to generate a linear combination of these weighted variables. And that's what we see on the right here um, in a, these latent components in the scores plot. So this is kind of a, a summary of all of this information and what we can start to see is that um, from right to left in this summary plot is moving from no treated, short, high intensity, repeated aeration, long, low intensity. So with increasing aeration duration, we get a move from left to right. And that correlates with um, some key factors that I just talked about. So wine color density highly correlated with opacity and total tannins highly correlated with astringency and they're higher. Um, so more opaque, more astringency in the non-aerated ferments. We also see uh, descriptors such as drain uh, being more, rated more highly in these untreated ferments. But then as we move to aeration, we tend to see higher concentrations of that other compound I talked about, ethyl 2 methyl butanoate and it's ethyl 3 metal methyl butanoate and other short branch chain aroma compounds um, associated over here with floral red fruit characteristics. So the decreased uh, phenolic amount in the wine and wine color density that we saw in the analytical measures on the previous slide also reflect the characteristics of these wines. So in this second example, I wanna look at ferments that received aeration for the same period of time, but were subjected to increasing intensities of aeration. So we gave them higher flow rates. In this case, again, Shiraz fermentations, 450 kilos, all of the wines received, all of the ferments received a long duration treatment of 40 hours, but at three different flow rates. So 0.25 liters per minute, 1.5 and five liters per minute. 
Again, sparged in via sinters installed in the bottom of the tank. And again, no effect on fermentation kinetics. So no matter how much air we added to these ferments, we really didn't um, dramatically reduce the time that these ferments took to finish. The total oxygen exposure here is reflected uh, in this graph on the right. On the left is the actual measures from the dissolved oxygen probe. So very, very low free dissolved oxygen uh, concentrations um, across the duration of the low treatment, but dissolved oxygen concentration starting to build up in that medium intensity and cumulative dissolved oxygen concentrations, again, quite high in that high intensity. So you can see over in the graph over on the left here that for the duration of that high treatment in green, um, the dissolved oxygen concentration was persistently for the entire 48, 40 odd hours around one mg per litre, whereas it's barely detectable in the low intensity treatment. And again, looking at uh, a partial least squares regression analysis of these wines, a very, very similar profile to what we just looked at from the previous one. We have uh, moving from uh, right on the scores plot here to the left, uh, going um, from decreasing to increasing aeration intensity, low intensity, medium intensity, high intensity uh, aeration treatments. The, no, the no, non aerated wines associated with um, higher opacity, higher astringency, higher total tannins, higher wine colour density as previously, and also higher concentrations of um, short branch chain aroma compounds associated with red fruit aroma, flavour and confection. So in summary to that red wine section, and this is a summary graph, I guess, summarising four, four years worth of chemical data, basically. Um, it's a heat map where the reds are higher concentrations of things and blue are lower concentrations of things and across the bottom um, chemical compounds. I'm not going to go into detail. It's just a, really a summary of all of that. What we see is increased concentrations of small branch chain compounds. This is reproducible across four vintages, different wines from different regions. More prominent floral aromas and red fruit, red fruit aroma and flavour. Decreased phenolic concentration in wine and decreased wine colour density. So those uh, things are increased in wines that hadn't seen any air. Um, and those things are associated with lower astringency and opacity. So what about white wine? I mentioned that they're quite different systems, both in the making of them, but also in their response. Um, to aeration. Um, but before getting into deliberately introducing air into a ferment, I thought it might be just worthwhile stopping for a second to think about the other sources of air in white wine. Because it's a different system, you start with pressing. What's the impact of pressing on, on your white wine? And um, here I'm showing a graph where a dissolved oxygen monitoring device was dropped into a press. So I've it's worthwhile thinking about how much air you introduce, but just by the mere act of pressing those grapes. So in red, it shows a, a standard bad press operating in normal press mode. And fairly consistently in that press, um, there's an air concentration in the press of around 80% of air saturation. So it's really uh, just constantly that liquid in there is um, close to saturation. This is, uh, contrasted with in, the, in green here, the same press operating in an inert press mode. So many of you will be aware that you can get presses that operate inertly and might, some, many of you might even use them for various things. And this just jet, uh, shows how effective uh, that pre those types of presses are in inert press mode at keeping air out. So uh, down to 3.3% air saturation or you know, um, 0.3 mg per litre roughly in the press during that inert press mode. So what's the effect of doing this type of thing? Uh, again, the, what I would say is that the um, control of oxygen exposure during processing generally has a very subtle effect on the impact of the finished wine. Um, if we press inertly and handle those wines reductively, uh, or those 
uh, juices prior to fermentation, handle it reductively. There's a very, very uh, small increase, but significant increase in floral and confection aromas. But as soon as we handle or don't protect those uh, juices during tank movement operations after inert pressing, we lose the really the impact of that inert pressing operation. So overall, um, processing controls have a very subtle impact on the finished product. We can get increases in perceived floral and aroma uh, and confection attributes uh, when we protect our juices from air during the processing component. Press mode in particular had the biggest impact, but um, that was really combined, depended a lot on how you subsequently handle those um, juices. And that's been published. Uh, that work's been published in the reference given at the bottom of the slide here. So moving on to uh, taking away that subtle effect of processing, what happens when you introduce air into ferments? So I've mentioned already that uh, the main reason for thinking about introducing air in particular into whites is to uh, think in, thinking about fermentation performance. So reducing the duration of those ferments. In this example, it's a very similar, I'm giving a very similar example of um, what was previously just presented for the red wines. In this case, we're doing uh, three different treatments, aeration treatments, showing in, in gray here in this graph, which shows the reduction in sugar concentration during active fermentation. These aeration treatments occurred for 48 hours and with or 48, 40, 48 hours with increasing intensity. It's really a mirror of the last um, treatment set that I showed for the red wines. So going from uh, 0.5 litres per minute per thousand litres to 3.3 to 33 litres per minute per thousand litres. Cumulative, cumulative oxygen exposure is shown in the graph here on the right. So almost undetectable dissolved oxygen concentrations during the life of those fermentations for the low aeration. Starting to build up again um, in the medium intensity treatment and very high cumulative oxygen exposures for the high intensity treatment. Reductions in fermentation time were dramatic for all oxygen treatments, but um, the maximum impact was delivered with the least amount of air in this treatment. So uh, in green here shows the lowest intensity treatment. These wines were um, kind of, I guess, hard. The, the ferment went on for quite some time before becoming eventually dry. Um, the lowest intensity treatment reduced that fermentation time to around 10 days. And we saw no additional impact by increasing the intensity of the treatment. What we did see by increasing the intensity of the treatment is increasing markers of oxidation effectively. So volatile acidity, it's a good marker of that. Um, in the low intensity treatment, we really saw no differences between the untreated wine and the low intensity treatment in terms of its overall volatile acidity. But as soon as the, we get to the medium intensity treatment, uh, volatile acidity up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 grams per liter in the high intensity treatment up to one gram per liter. So again, becoming quite high for a white wine. We looked at the sensory impact of this uh, using a rapid method, uh, napping with ultra flash profiling. What you can see here is the highly aerated ferments over, over on the far left here, um, associated with attributes you would normally associate with oxidation. So vinegar, nail polish remover, etc. And the wines made with limited aeration are generally indistinguishable from mine, wines made without aeration. So the, I guess done with a light hand, aeration in whites can dramatically um, reduce the time it takes to complete fermentations without an impact on the finished product effectively. So does the mode of aeration make a difference? Um, when we start thinking about only um, the reduction in aeration, uh, reduction in fermentation time, um, I guess, do, we, do you have options in how you uh, aerate those ferments? And that's what we were looking at here. Um, it's a little bit about timing and it's also a little bit about uh, 
trying to put the air in in a single um, dose rather than a long, uh, rather than a long intense or low intensity aeration. So here we're measuring those things. Shown the graph here on the on the left is the fermentation kinetic profiles. Um, the no treatment is in purple. The long low intensity treatment in blue with a maximum maximum effect. So very similar to the previous graph we had uh, in these. Um, ferments, again, they were quite tough, very low yan ferments in this case, um, taking very, very long time to finish, ultimately about 30 odd days to complete these ferments. Um, the, we didn't add any extra nitrogen to these ferments and the uh, long, low intensity ferment reduced that fermentation time to around 10 days. So it was a pretty good outcome from that perspective. The fermentation profile in terms of fermentation connects were improved with just using a singular short high intensity aeration um, during a key uh, time during fermentation. So about 80% of initial sugar, but the impact of that wasn't as great as the long low intensity for um, aeration treatment. Overall cumulative oxygen exposures for those two are kind of similar, although higher for the uh, short, in, short high intensity treatments, but the effect of those was less than the long, low intensity treatment. For all of these treatments, um, in this case, there was no impact on volatile acidity. So generally no change in the uh, general profile of those wines. And they haven't been through sensory yet, so I can't really tell you what they are likely to look like, but um, I'm gonna guess that there's probably no differences between those wines and the untreated control. Simon, we've had a quick question here around um, the temperature of the white ferments. Are you able to provide any information around that one? Sure, temperatures of white ferments were 17 degrees uh, when the cooling systems were working appropriately. So um, yeah, kept, kept at 17 degrees until uh, very close towards the end, in which case cooling was turned off and they came to winery temperature, so yeah. So yeah, so to summarize that, a light hand with aeration treatments really here in whites is, is key to avoid the buildup of dissolved oxygen. And that really prevents um, the development of oxidative attributes such as volatile acidity becoming apparent in those wines. So summarizing the white wine side of things, Processing in general had a very subtle impact. The dominant factor there was pressing, uh, but that really relied on how you handled that juice after it was pressed. Um, oxidative handling really undid all the, all the protective effects of uh, the, the inert pressing cycles. During fermentation, introduction of air in whites reduce has a big impact on, can have a big impact on fermentation performance, really um, increasing or decreasing the duration of those ferments in circumstances where those juices were really very tough. Um, low inputs, low air inputs were really required for maximum uh, performance impact, but above a certain threshold, there was negative effects on wine quality. So that really contrasts heavily with what we saw in reds where those reds were really very robust to high uh, concentrations of air going through that system, we really saw no um, noticeable impact on, from a sensory perspective, in terms of attributes associated with oxidation. So how can you make this work in the winery? Um, in the first, I've got a quick video here to show uh, an approach that you could use. I guess some people may think that um, just shoving a, an air spear into their ferment and sparging a bit of air through there is gonna be an effective way of introducing air into the system. And what you can see here is a, a large fermentation vessel. Uh, we've got a probe going into the center of this vessel uh, being met, monitored here uh, and met, monitoring the dissolved oxygen concentration right in the guts of it. Oop. So it's sparging basics. So what you might see in this video uh, probably is not something that will get past some workplace health and safety um, guidelines. But what you can see is uh, 
how much air is going through that system and what's likely to be happening to it. And what we can see here is uh, just the actual results of that type of aeration operation, 2.2% air saturation. That's uh, very, very low concentrations of dissolved oxygen in that ferment. Um, and it really tells you that that process is not a, that type of process is not a particularly effective way of introducing um, air into a ferment. Most of that air is just bubbling straight out of the top without really um, partitioning into the liquid phase. So even though you might find yourself doing something similar, I, I would argue it's not uh, the best way to try and do that compared to the 25% um, or 50% air saturation that we were sort of seeing in our pilot scale work. So what can you do uh, effectively in the winery? There's a range of different devices that are currently available. And what I've pictured on the screen here is um, two main types of choices about how you could do this. Um, either a splash tub or um, introducing some sort of air introduction device into a pump over circuit for REDS. Uh, so in particular, I'm gonna talk about the splash, the, the air injection devices in the pump over circuit first, and I'll come to the splash tub um, later. How you use these types of devices, and here I've shown a, um, a, a Venturi injector um, that can suck air in uh, through the side and a vortex sparger that has a sinter built in to the housing. Uh, and this really requires a supply of air being pumped in to it. Both of these can be uh, installed into the pump over circuit either side of the pump, but really what type of device you might use really depends highly on the type of pump you have. So you really need to pair your device with your pump before uh, going down this path. Um, I might just move on to the next slide. I can't remember what else I have to say on this one. So splash tub racking first. This is a picture straight out of the handbook of enology. And it really shows that, uh, I guess, a more traditional way of trying to introduce air into a red ferment is by draining uh, the ferment out into a splash tub and then pumping that back in onto the top of the ferment. So what does this look like in practice? So here's a picture on the right uh, where a red ferment is running out straight into a uh, a large uh, bin, this could be any type of holding vessel, and then pump back in. The mean dissolved oxygen concentration following this type of operation is around 30% uh, of air saturation or around two and a half mg per litre. 30% air saturation is probably sufficient for a one volume pump, pump over, and it might help improve reductive aroma, aromas in those wines, potentially, but um, modify it tannin structural elements, but less so than a, um, those more uh, long duration exposures that I talked about earlier. You can increase the turbulence in this system by putting an inclined plane into these types of pubs, at, uh, tubs as shown here on the left. Uh, that should increase the dissolved oxygen concentration, but I haven't shown that type of data here. Alternatively, you can use an, uh, a sparging device, like I talked about earlier. Here's one pictured, um, plumbed in to the pump over circuit. And using this type of device, it was possible to achieve around 60% air saturation into that um, wine or that ferment following the introduction of the air. Um, so look, looking downstream of the pump over circuit. So this device, you're doing it this way, it's almost twice as effective as that splash type operation. It's generally much easier and cleaner cellar work. It's amenable to automation. So if you've got uh, automated control, PLC controller type stuff, um, it works pretty well with that. It avoids potential contamination, but does require um, the purchase of a particular device and a clean air supply. A similar sort of thing could be plumbed in with a vortex sparger. Um, and then you avoid the need for a, a clean air supply or stress on, on the types of um, air supply that you might have. So finally, I'm coming here to uh, what happens in large scale tanks in an, in an event where you might have um, pulse air operation to, to use for cap management. So if you have pulse air installed in your tanks and you're doing, using those for cap management, how much air are you actually introducing? And I guess going back to my initial points around 
And what we're trying to do is find the most efficient ways to introduce air. Generally, what we're talking about is um, reducing the size of the air bubbles and increasing the amount of time those small air bubbles spend in the liquid. And the problem, of course, with pulse air is that they generate very, it generates very large air bubbles that rise very quickly to the surface. But also um, these uh, pulse air devices potentially uh, allow the air to stay around for a reason, reasonable period of time simply because of the height of the tanks that these devices are used in. So the air bubble, um, although it's large, might spend a reasonable amount of time traveling through the liquid to the top. And of course, there's gonna be a cap on the top here where all that air is gonna accumulate underneath. So um, as a part of looking at this, uh, Martin Day, who was part of this project for quite a long time, and I'll, I'll, I guess I haven't mentioned individuals, I'll thank them all at the end, but Martin went out to a winery and um, installed uh, these mini dot dissolved oxygen measuring devices at different heights inside a um, commercial tank, 150,000 litres with pulse air installed at the bottom at Richmond Grove and uh, monitored at the three different heights within that tank, uh, the dissolved oxygen concentrations that accumulated during different pulse air operations. And shown in the graph here in the middle is you can see uh, the recordings from those devices um, during these numerous pump air operations. Uh, pulse air operations. So, can, so there is some accumulation of air over, over time, um, especially in the top parts of the tank. What we saw is that in the bottom parts of the tank, there's very, very little dissolved oxygen accumulating there. So there's probably not a, a lot as much mixing as we probably thought, but in the top parts of this tank, uh, much more accumulation of dissolved oxygen in the liquid phase. So on the left hand part of the graph is one of these little peaks uh, blown up. Um, it comes up to around 10% air saturation and it, and it remains at that up there for you know, around 10 minutes. So cumulatively, that's probably a reasonable amount of air and it has got us thinking whether pulse air installations can be used for introducing um, air or for aerating ferments in a way which we probably haven't thought about previously. And really we're thinking about this because it's a way of making use of existing infrastructure for folks that have already in invested in that. So the take home messages from this talk, so I'm coming towards the end here. Um, there are practical devices available for aeration. Um, generally, I would say that for management of REDS in particular, require more aeration than you might think. So just spending, uh, putting a, a spear into a tank and trying to push bubbles through it is probably not gonna have as big an impact that you might want. White ferments really require a nuanced application of air. Uh, the impact is predominantly on fermentation performance and red, but red ferments are very robust towards this type of treatment. Um, and the impact is predominantly on style. So if you're, if you're introducing air into red ferments to manage fermentation performance, it's probably not going to be the way forward for you, I think. So here come uh, really my final slide. I just want to acknowledge um, what is really a very large group of people who have contributed to this work over years. Uh, Martin Marlies, Karen, Stella, Damien, uh, Mark, Paul, and Alex. Um, there's gonna be others as well. I'm sorry if I haven't acknowledged you. John Gledhill and Wick Winemaking who have been involved in making all the different wines I've been talking about. The sensory team have done a huge amount of work trying to put all this um, different uh, sensory evaluations together, including the tasting panels who have to try all these wines, metabolomics who have been doing a lot of the analytical measures for us. Wine Australia, of course, for funding this work, but also a large number of winemakers and wineries who've uh, made available different resources, access to tanks and ferments, sometimes supplying juice. Without them, it's really hard to do work on this scale. Um, 450 litre ferments times 12 starts to add up over the years and um, being able to have access to uh, raw material, but also um, large fermentation vessels for monitoring what's going on inside them has been really useful and informative uh, and hopefully means that we can provide uh, relevant information around this type of treatment back to the industry. So thank you all for listening and um, I'll hand it back over to Michael. Okay, terrific. Simon, thanks very much for sharing um, results around these trials and also some really um, significant take home messages for the audience today.
Um, we're going to roll from here into a Q&A. So if you do have any questions, Simon's going to stick around for a little while. Um, so please take, um, take this opportunity to shoot through any questions you may have. Um, just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, open the Q&A um, button in your Zoom toolbar and type your question and send it through. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in already, Simon. Uh, the first one relates to at what BOME would you stop aerating for reds? Are you able to indicate a, um, some information around that one? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. We've done some experiments looking at late aerations and found them not to be particularly effective. So I would uh, consider anything past 50% of initial sugars to be probably not uh, the most effective time. And I, in some ways, it's very similar to whites. We would say that the most impactful time to be aerating a ferment is during that 80% to 60% of initial sugars. Um, so strangely, they have quite different effects, but uh, for reds, yeah, that we still get those major major impacts by aerating during that earlier phase of fermentation. Okay, thanks, Simon, and thanks, Andrew, for your question. Um, we've got a question here about whether racking is appropriate for a smallish 500 litre ferment, for a white ferment, rather. Look, I haven't really, for those types of um, smaller ferments, we really haven't looked at that for whites, but given that the amount of air when we have seen, the amount of air introduced or the amount of oxygen introduced through a racking operation, and it depends on the type of rack, racking operation, I guess if you're as pictured in sort of that um, handbook of enology picture, if you're racking in that sort of way, you really need to have enough um, time for the air to interact. But I would say, introduced at the right time, then I would say that, that would probably be an effective treatment for whites. But again, you're aiming for whites in terms of managing fermentation performance, you're trying to give that air to the growing yeast population. So earlier in that case for whites is going to be better. As soon as they start vigorously fermenting, it gets harder and harder to introduce air. The CO2 that's produced by the, um, by the actively fermenting yeast is really at, at the same time stripping that dissolved oxygen out. So um, yeah, for whites earlier, probably better. Sure, thank you, Simon. Um, another question here from Gordon. Did you look at iron content in these, in these wines? Um, and a comment around being surprised to see there was no effect of fermentation kinetics in the red wine. Um, in the past, we have looked at iron content in these wines, and we do find that aeration tends to reduce the concentration of a range of different metal ions. That's also um, made it out in the published literature, and I think I might have provided one of those publications um, in the talk itself. Um, we were surprised too, but it's quite a robust finding. I think we've now looked at this in rotary fermenters and four vintages of open top fermenters. And no matter how much air we add in, there's just no reduction in fermentation performance. Um, they're different. It's a range of different yans. We don't tend to augment yan in these treatments, but we're going from quite low yan to relatively robust yan concentrations. Um, and similarly, a range of different sugar concentrations. I guess we just never see it for reds where the effect is very, very dramatic for whites. So I'm, I guess looking at the, at the data over the last number of years, I'm as surprised as you are really, I, I would have anticipated that that's what we would have seen too, but um, no matter which way we did it, we never really came across a ferment that was dramatically reduced in its fermentation duration due to aeration. Okay, thanks Simon. Um, can you give some further details on the method used to introduce the low levels of oxygen in white wine? Yeah, sure. Look, um, I gave you a picture, I guess, earlier on in the talk of the sparges that we had that we had made and uh, sort of just placed in the bottom of the tank, and then really introduce. We um, we had. You could do this from a compressor or uh, an, an air cylinder, 
and then um, we just we use uh, just ball valve type airflow devices that are fairly relatively cheap from I think we get them from BOC and then just leaking it in so um, we just leave those centers in there and set the thing to go for 24 hours and just leak it in over that period um, yeah maybe half a mil per half a what do I say 500 mils per liter which is per thousand liters of ferment which uh, which isn't very much yeah per minute half a mil per minute per thousand liters okay thanks for your question there Mike um, also got a question here about whether you're able to provide some information around hyperoxidation in relation to specifically Chardonnay. Hyperoxidation. Uh, I'm not sure. I really, I'm not sure what to say in regards to this uh, question. Actually, um, if maybe if the questioner could provide a bit more detail about what, what it is they wanted to find out. But I have to say, we haven't really studied hyperoxidation in any um, substantial way, and I might not be the right person to talk about it too. So um, maybe it's best that I don't weigh in on that. But if you do want to provide with a bit more of a specific question, if I can't answer it, then maybe I can forward it on to someone who can. Yeah, sure. We can certainly follow that up post-session if need be. Marcus, alternatively, yeah, Simon suggested, sent through another question. Um, if you had a white ferment starting to slow near the end, when would be the latest you would add your air oxygen, Simon? Uh, that would really depend on, we've done it both for whites and reds. Um, and we see, for, Again, for whites, I'm much more nervous because the, the later on in ferment you go, the higher the risk you run of introducing oxidative problems. And, but we have actually tested that for whites. Uh, and if you're, again, using a very light hand, um, we didn't see any oxidative damage on those whites. And we did, strangely, surprisingly to us, find that did help those ferments get through ever so slightly. But look, the impact at that point was marginal, I have to say. So I would be hesitant to do it. Um, we, we, when we did it, it was with 20% of sugar remaining. So going from, you know, it might've been at two Bome or something like that. Sure, thanks, Simon. A uh, question here from Joel. Um, and Joel says, your results show that you got higher colour intensity, intensity reds for low or no oxygen exposure. Um, and have you done any further research on the colour stability of those wines over time? Um, Look, we have early on looked at these the development of these wines over very over a large number of uh, well, I guess what's the longest period of time? Probably four years. Um, and also, there's been some of this work published more recently. And I, I probably would, for a very detailed answer about what's going on in terms of color stability, I would refer to Karen Binden on this question. But what we do see is that, um, ooh. Color stability, um, I'm not really sure what the question is in regards to color stability, whether color stability decreases over time, whether you lose color um, over time with aeration, or whether you retain color stability without aeration. But um, so I, I guess there's two ways of thinking about that question and maybe a bit more clarity there would be useful in terms of trying to answer it. But what we do see generally is that over time, we, we tend not to see any dramatic changes in color once those wines have been bottled. Um, so whatever, it, whatever is there roughly around the time of bottling um, or in our first sensory assessment effect, in effect. So sometimes those sensory assessments don't occur for um, between four and 12 months. So those wines do spend that time in bottle um, before we have a look at them. 
Uh, and we have gone back to look at some of them a, a year or two later, and we see that generally that there's no difference or no discernible difference at that time. So the wines look very similar to what they did 12 months earlier. I guess that's uh, the best amount of detail I can say uh, with regards to trying to generalise out of that question. But I do know that there's more, very much more specific information out there on the impacts of um, tannin structural rearrangements and phenolic structural rearrangements and anthocyanin structural rearrangements um, in regards to their interaction with um, acid aldehyde and other uh, phenolic components and the impacts of that on colour intensity and stability. So, but again, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question, but I can get back to you with an answer if you uh, would like to leave contact details. Yeah, thanks for that, Simon. And Joel, look, if you do want to leave um, your contact information, I mean, we already have an email address for you, but um, yeah, if you do want some further information, just send through another um, question or comment in the Q&A. Um, with regard to the reds, the red ferments treated with the long and low air fermentation that had lower phenolics. Did you look further at microox requirements? That's a pretty quick answer. No, we didn't look at further micro-oxygenating micro those ferments. So I'm assuming there you're referring to um, what we typically call micro-ox in tank, uh, uh, post-ferment in tank micro-ox. No, we didn't do any of that. Um, we just were really interested in whether or not um, what the impact was of adding air during fermentation and then stabilizing those wines uh, on completion. Okay, thanks Simon. Uh, I've got a question here about how effective, specifically with regard to reds, how effective or what difference would there be when considering place, placement of the center, so whether it's on the outlet of the pump instead of the inlet during a pump over? Hmm. I guess it's a bit more of a nuanced question. It, typically, whether or not you do it at the outlet of the pump or the inlet of, on, of the pump, again, is going to require, is going to depend a little bit on the pump that you have. Having it on the inlet of the pump means that the mechanical action of the pump itself helps to get those, to generate um, that fine bubble mixture uh, that will help the um, air get into the liquid um, and having it on the outlet of the pump it, again some to some degree it's going to depend on the uh, the length of the hose or the you know the pipe going from that center um, to the pump over to the irrigation head so if you've got a reasonably long tube there or a long uh, pipe work then uh, those the air that's introduced at that point is gonna have a long time to interact with the liquid. And so I would say there's probably minimal impact on whether or not the uh, center is on the outlet or the inlet of the pump. And But really it's, I think the answer to that question is more about the effectiveness, it's less about the effectiveness of getting air in and more about the pairing of the particular device you use with a particular type of pump you use. So those that'd be the primary consideration for me. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, got a question here about whether you've got any thoughts on sulfur compound formation, reabsorption or shifting. Yeah, look, this has been a question we've been quite interested in. Um, and also Marlies Beck has done some more recent work on using aeration as a remediation tool. But what we um, almost always see, at least in reds, is a reduction in hydrogen sulfide formation and the formation of other volatile, small, low molecular weight volatile sulfur compounds. Um, if the potential for their formation is already low, so say for example, you've got a very healthy um, uh, juice with um, a good amount of nitrogen in there and that very little uh, H2S is already being formed, then adding air 
at that point doesn't reduce it any further. But if you have a high potential for H2S formation, then we do see a quite dramatic reduction in the production of those compounds. Whether or not they are, whether or not they're production is reduced. So in this case, whether or not the yeast are just making less H2S or whether all that H2S that's being produced by the yeast is being bound up um, by oxidized components in the juice or in the ferment itself is difficult to discern. But one way or the other, um, those wines, once they're bottled, remain uh, fresh and we have a generally a reduction or a, a decrease in reductive characters in the finished wine. Okay, we've had a late question come in, Simon. Might make this the last one. Um, it's from Marco who says, I might have missed this earlier. How does the Venturi injector perform compared to the splash tub in terms of saturation percentage? Yeah, look, I didn't, oh, well, you, you didn't miss it. I didn't present Venturi injector data but I would say that Venturi injectors are, equipped, are quite effective and efficient means of getting air in. Um, and they're very similar in, in that sense to the uh, sintered air injectors that I, was, that I did present data on. So they, they would be more effective than a splash tub if you had access to them. Um, and I do know that there's a large number of wineries probably that do use them. Um, so, uh, but again, whether or not you can, it's possible for you to use them really depends on your pump type. Okay, thanks, Simon. I think we'll leave it there. Did you have any final comments before we um, start to wrap this one up? Um, no specific final comments, but I would say that, well, uh, look, we are interested, we're, as I said, uh, probably at the very start of this talk, we're moving much more into that from the how, why you'd want to do it into the, uh, from the why, why you'd want to do it into the how, how are we going to, how we're going about it. And we are interested in um, getting out and uh, in getting ourselves involved or helping people with industry trials. If, if people are interested in pursuing this type of um, intervention for their winemaking, we'd be very much interested in uh, collaborating with you on those types of uh, ventures. Um, we're also putting together packages of material to help folks do that if they're interested in trying it. So I think Michael might have mentioned earlier that there will be um, information being put together and uh, put together and available via the AWR website um, in the coming six months, I guess, as we as we start to aggregate all of that stuff, uh, including, I guess, this talk plus written material, fact sheets, um, uh, other types of things that we might think about. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and yeah, and, and also to remind folks, and Michael might also give this reminder at the end about um, the getting involved in that process of contributing to um, the provision of those types of materials. So, yeah. No, other than that, thanks everyone for listening. Great to have this opportunity. Okay, thanks very much, Simon. And yeah, I think Simon's already touched on some of the um, things to be aware of and look out for. The first one will be that survey that will be sent out shortly. So if you are interested in getting involved in some oxygen related trials um, with the AWRI, then um, yeah, keep an eye out for that and please complete and send it back. Um, thank you, Simon, for um, coming in and sharing some really valuable insights and take home messages around this topic. Um, I think it was a really great presentation and certainly some feedback we've had from audience indicates, um, indicates that also. Um, thank you also to the audience, everyone that logged in and participated in today's session. Um, Attendees, as always, you'll receive a, a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this session. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Acknowledgements to Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars by the AWRI Extension Project. Um, the next AWRI webinar is on
Thursday, the 26th of November, um, Dr. Naomi Benger from the Bureau of Meteorology and Dr. Paul Petrie from Sardi take an in-depth look at climate drivers and outlooks and what they mean for the wine grape growing sector. So if you'd like to register for this session and you haven't done so already, uh, please visit the AWRI website. Um, that's all we have for today. Thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.